We welcome you to Calvary Bible Chapel on this beautiful Lord's Day morning, and we pray God's richest blessing upon you as you sit under the ministry of His Word. We are at the end of 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Our study is uh, brotherly love, doubts about the determining doctrine, and I believe this is part 7. Real quickly, want to review the questions that have been asked and answered is your belief vain? We appreciate grace because of the resurrection. In verses 12 through 19, how say some among you that there is no resurrection of the dead? We receive hope because of the resurrection. If the dead rise not at all, we are guaranteed eternal life through the resurrection. Why stand we in jeopardy every hour, and how are the dead raised up? Sanctification and glorification are the result of resurrection. And now we come to our final section, O death, where is thy sting? O death, where is thy sting? We achieve victory in the resurrection. So we're going to be concentrating this morning in verses 51 through the end of the chapter. So let's read it very quickly. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and we're going to start in verse 51. Behold, that is a important word, isn't it? Every time you see the word behold in your Bible, it should, you know, make you want to uh, Really pay attention. I wish Mr. Ace Ball was here, huh? We'd ask him to, uh, <laughs> to say, Behold, there you go, brother. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall be changed. In a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must, I love that word, must put on incorruption. And this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O oh, death! Where is thy sting? O oh, grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. This whole chapter has been about the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. From the first verse to now, the topic is about the resurrection of, the Jesus, of Jesus Christ. And we know that there were some people in the church of Corinth who were doubting the resurrection. They didn't understand the resurrection. So as we come to this final section, I, I don't know that I had ever really put these two thoughts together that the resurrection guarantees that there's going to be a rapture. A rapture. So this morning, in part 7 of our study, we have the showing in verse 51. We have the saying in verse 54. And then, who am I kidding? We're not getting to the song this morning. We'll get to the song next week. Beloved, next week, the victory service, I guess they really all should be. But we'll, we'll save the song for next week. Thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. For this week, though, we're going to talk about the showing, and then just a moment on the same. But we're really going to concentrate on here, on this thought of the showing. So let's go back to verse 51, where the Lord inspires Paul to write, Behold, 
I show you, I show you a what? What does it say? A mystery. What is a mystery? Well, it's something that can be understood. Let me stress that. When you read about mysteries in your Bible, do not say, oh, well, we can't understand that. Let's just go on to another portion of Scripture. Please don't. The purpose of a mystery was that it was to be hidden from a bygone dispensation. Now, there are numerous mysteries in Scripture, and please don't try to write these down. They're in your bulletin, okay? And they're probably too small for you <laughs> to even see. I was trying to make it the mystery of the divine indwelling, uh, the mystery of the union of Jew and Gentile in one body, the church, mystery of the seven stars and the seven candlesticks, the mystery of Israel's blindness, the mystery of iniquity, the mystery of Babylon the Great, the mystery of the church as the, uh, 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 yeah, as the, as the bride of Christ. Numerous, numerous mysteries in the Bible especially in the New Testament, revealed to us not so that we wouldn't under, or we can't understand them. But understand, being a dispensationalist, you have to realize that there are certain things that God did not reveal to a bygone dispensation. The church was a mystery. And for good reason. If Jesus was to come back and everyone know that everyone knew that he was going to be rejected, then it wouldn't have been a bodified offer to the Jews at the time. So the church had to be a mystery. If the, uh, if the Lord Jesus was going to come back and say, I'm the Messiah. If you accept me at this time as your Messiah, as you receive me as your Messiah, then I'll set up my kingdom right now. So the church had to be a mystery. Because Christ, as we just heard in song, he came to be rejected. So a mystery isn't something that needs to be, uh, that, that can't be understood. A mystery is something that was hidden from a bygone dispensation. But as far as I know, all of these mysteries are something that you and I have complete Ability to understand because we have the full and written Word of God. So as we look this morning at the mystery that the Apostle Paul is talking about here in verse 51, Behold, I show you a mystery, we shall not all sleep. But we shall be changed. What is he talking about? He's talking about the rapture. We shall not all sleep. Does that mean that uh, maybe some of you are like me and you don't sleep well? No. It means that we're, some of us may not die. Now I want you to link that in this chapter with what he's been talking about, the Apostle Paul, since the very beginning. It's the resurrection. It's the resurrection that guarantees that some of us may not die. It may be the next generation. It may be the generation following that. We don't know when the rapture is going to occur. But we do know that it's going to occur. I have been burdened lately. with how many people either don't believe that they see a rapture in Scripture at all. And I did talk to a nice gentleman one day. It was at the, at the beginning of a, right at the beginning of a basketball game and he was at the scores table and he was teaching a class and it says the book of Revelation and I went, oh, you know, and I said, I'm a dispensationalist. And he says, I don't see a rapture in Scripture. It broke my heart. It broke my heart. 
But it also breaks my heart because I've spoken to Christians and I've asked them, do you believe in the rapture? And they say, yes. I said, well, then do you understand when it's going to take? take place. No, I, I don't know. There's just too much. There's just, no. There's not too much. Throw away all of your books and stick with the scriptures, please. Too many people. I even heard of someone who had believed in the rapture was going to happen at any minute. Basically, this person is probably in her 80s and now. And now she's questioning when the rapture is going to happen. Satan is attacking this doctrine. And I'm going to do my very best to combat that this morning. I'm going to show you, we're going to go through each one of these portions of Scripture, and we're going to do it as thoroughly as I can in the time that we have. By God's grace, by the end of this worship time this morning, you should have confidence on when the rapture is going to happen. It is Hugely, hugely important. And we'll see why as we move through this. So the Apostle Paul says, I show you a mystery. And as far as I know, um, in the New Testament epistles, this is the first time that the, this mystery of the rapture was revealed. I think that probably Jesus was thinking of this when he said, I go to prepare a place for you in John 14. And if I go and prepare a place for you, what did he say? I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am there you may be also. I think that might have been a little hint, because who's he speaking to? He's speaking to the disciples. And the disciples were going to be a part of the church when it started in Acts chapter 2 on the day of Pentecost. So there was a little hint, but this, I'm not sure that they understood So the Lord inspires Paul. I show you a mystery. Behold, we shall not all sleep because of the resurrection. And I want to stress that again. Because of what we've been talking about for a whole chapter, now I want to reveal to you this wonderful truth that one of our generations is not even going to taste death. And it could happen today. What a, what a wonderful, wonderful hope. It's called the blessed hope in the book of Titus. We shall not all sleep, but we shall be changed. This body will be changed. It's impossible for this body to go to heaven. Did you, do you realize that? Too wicked. Too wicked. Heaven is a perfect place, worshiping a perfect person. And for you to be able to do that, you must be perfect. And I'm guaranteeing you it will happen. I'm guaranteeing you it will happen, not because I think so, but because of the Word of God. We shall all be changed. In a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, I read a commentary on that, that literally this word means like atom, and it's slicing the atom, and you, you get down to where you can't slice the atom anymore. In other words, you have minutes, seconds, and then you slice that second as much as you possibly can. That's how fast it's going to happen. That's the, that's the thought here. At the last trump, and I'm, I'm really... Uh, anxious to look at that trump and I think that will be part of our our study next week for the trump shall sound for the dead shall be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed so everyone that's part of the church from the day of Pentecost up to this very time that has already gone to be with the Lord they shall 
rise incorruptible. And then <laughs> we're just going to, oh, okay, <laughs> we're changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, this mortal must put on immortality. Oh, what two wonderful musts there. So let's look at these portions of Scripture. Something, beloved, that I guess I've just taken for granted. Maybe my whole life. Because I've believed that the rapture would happen. Uh, by the way, as I mentioned, Satan is attacking this doctrine. And I, I understand why now. I don't know that I fully understood before considering this. But I, I understand why He's attacking this doctrine. The doctrine of the rapture because of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. So let's look at 1 Thessalonians 4. That's the first portion of scripture that we're going to come to. And I do think that you'll see. 1 Thessalonians 4. We're going to start in verse 13. But I would not have you to be ignorant. So there is a ignorancy even then as there is today. Uh, by the way, I believe in a rapture and I believe it is going to happen before the tribulation starts. You can stick a gun to my head. You might as well pull it, beloved. I'm not changing. There are people who believe in mid-trib, pre-wrath, post-trib. This worship service this morning is centered around a pre-tribulation rapture. And I'll show you why I believe that from these portions of Scripture. But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that are dead, that you sorrow not, even as others that, which have no hope. And not, nothing wrong with sorrowing. It, we just don't sorrow like people who have no hope. I have been to funerals where I have preached funerals where I wasn't sure the person was saved or not. I have been to funerals where I knew the person was saved. <laughs> it's, it's night and day. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, did you, do you catch that? Do you catch that the foundation of the rapture is in the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ? Even so them which also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him those that are already dead. For we say unto you by the word of the Lord that which we that which excuse me that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep those of us who are not dead when the Lord comes for his bride for the church we won't prevent them they're going to go first I think it's going to be just like that for the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God. There's that trump, uh, that trumpet, the song again. And the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up. And I want you to grasp that Greek word, caught up. That's the rapture of the church. We which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them, Christ, and the dead part of the, the dead saints, if you will, the church, to meet the Lord in the air. So shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. How can you comfort somebody? How can we comfort one another when there's so much confusion about the rapture? Satan loves this confusion, beloved. 
Okay, I have uh, two other portions of scripture where this thought of being caught up is mentioned. Acts chapter 8, verse 39. We're going to read the word caught up. I believe it's one Greek word. Caught up or caught away. And we're going to read that in Acts 8, 39. This is when Philip was ministering to the Ethiopian eunuch. You remember that Philip was taken away from a rather large ministry to go and minister to one man in Acts chapter 8, the Ethiopian eunuch. The Lord said, I want you to go and I want you to talk to this man. You remember that the eunuch was, uh, he, he was on his chariot and Philip catches him and uh, the eunuch is wondering about some things of the Lord and Philip gets to share with him Isaiah 53 and the, the Ethiopian eunuch gets saved and wants to be baptized and so that's what's happening now and when they were come up out of the water so Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch are now um, being uh, he is baptizing the Ethiopian eunuch, and as they come up out of the water, it says that the Spirit of the Lord caught away Philip. And that word caught away is the same word as in 1 Thessalonians 4, caught up. Can you imagine what it must have been like for the Ethiopian eunuch? Philip says, in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, he dunks him, and as he comes up, no more Philip. He's gone. I mean, Pastor, you, you really believe that just one day all the Christians are going to disappear from the face of the earth? With all my heart. With all my heart. I don't know what it's going to be like after that. We know Daniel's 70th week will begin after that. The Spirit of the Lord caught away Philip, that the eunuch saw him no more. And he went on his way rejoicing. He went on his way rejoicing. Okay, 2 Corinthians chapter 12. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, again we have this same word. This is not the only two times that this portion, uh, this word is used, but it's uh, the context in which it's used. It's in the same context. Now we have the Apostle Paul and he's telling about an experience where, uh, and he's not even sure exactly where he was. But he's telling about an experience. Let's start in verse 2. I knew a man in Christ above 14 years ago, whether in body I cannot tell or whether out of, out of body I cannot tell, God knoweth. Such as one caught up to the third heaven. Did you catch it? Here the Apostle Paul is and he's having, he thinks maybe a vision, but he's not sure, but all of a sudden, he disappears. And all of a sudden, he's in the third heaven. And I knew such a man, verse 3, whether in body or out of body, I cannot tell, God knoweth, how that he was caught up into paradise. There it is again. And I heard unspeakable words which it is not lawful for a man to utter. The Apostle Paul experienced and heard things, beloved, that all of our loved ones who have gone before us are now experiencing. What hope? Oh, I'm sorry, I have one more. Revelation. Revelation chapter 12, verse 5. I'm I apologize. Again, this word caught up is used. Uh, I was just going to read that one verse, but probably should do us well. Uh, to start in verse 1. Revelation chapter tw 12. Revelation chapter 12. 
It says, and there appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman, and I would ask you to consider that the woman is Israel, clothed with the sun and the moon, that possibly could be Jacob and Rachel, under her feet, and upon her head a crown of twelve stars. Twelve stars, meaning the twelve sons of Jacob. And she, the woman, Israel, being with child, cried, travailing in birth and pained to be delivered. So now we're talking about the incarnation of our Savior in verse 2. Verse 3, and there appeared another wonder in heaven, and behold, a great red dragon, that would be Satan, having seven heads and ten horns and seven cr crowns upon his heads. And his tail drew the third part of the stars out of heaven, and it did cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman, which was ready to be delivered, for to devour her child as soon as it was born. And we know that uh, there was a... A great massacre of children because of the wickedness of Rome. Verse 5, And she brought forth a man-child, Israel brought forth Christ, who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron. And then the Bible says, And her child was caught up unto, her, unto God and to his throne. And when I first read that, I thought of the ascension of Christ, but um, I actually would now consider that his resurrection. He was caught up. And you may think differently. I don't know. I haven't studied that portion of Scripture in a long time, but uh, whoa, where'd all my screens go? I'm getting all excited here. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. So we have the word caught up. To literally to be snatched and it's with force, I believe, is the thought there. Acts chapter 8, 2 Corinthians 12, Revelation 12. Um, okay, so let's go to uh, Revelation chapter 3, verse 10. I want you to now consider the fact... Those verses really talk about that there is a rapture. But now the question, and this is a extremely important question that I, you must answer scripturally. When does the rapture happen? Again, there is a huge division in Christianity on when the rapture is going to happen. Is it before the tribulation period, is it at the middle of the tribulation period, is it pre-wrath, which is, is, is very, very popular today with um, reformed theologians? Is it post? Are, 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 we in the, are we in the tribulation now? Many, many different views. No comfort. No unity. And very little hope. So we have Revelation chapter 3, and in Revelation chapters 2 and 3, you have the seven letters that are written to the seven churches in Asia. I believe that these are actual churches that were on the earth at the time that John is penning under inspiration. I also believe that there are churches like these seven churches throughout the world today, right now. I personally also believe that we could look at this from a prophetic standpoint from generation to generation. But I want you to see what the Lord writes to the church of Philadelphia. And of course, that would be the the church that we want our church to be like. 
unto the, uh, let's start in verse 7, unto the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, These things saith he that is holy, he that is true, he that hath the key of David, he that openeth and no man shutteth, and shutteth and no man openeth. I know thy works. Behold, I have set, thee, uh, set before thee an open door, and no man can shut it. For thou hast a little strength, and hast kept my word, and hast not denied my name. Behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan, which say they are Jews and are not, but do lie. Behold, I will make them to come and worship before thy feet, and to know that I have loved thee. Verse 10. Because thou hast kept the word of my patience... I will also keep thee from the hour of temptation. I believe that the Lord is telling this church that he is going to keep them from the tribulation period. Look over to chapter 4, verse 1. After this, after what? After the seven churches in Asia... After the church age, after the dispensation of grace, the Lord says, After this I looked, John says, And behold, a door was opened in heaven, and the first voice which I heard was as it were a trumpet talking with me. There's that trumpet again. We've heard it two or three times now, which said, Come up hither. After the church age, the church age ends with the rapture of the church. In Revelation chapter 4, verse 1, Come up hither, and I will show thee things which must be hereafter. And essentially, from chapter 4 to chapter 19, is talking about the tribulation period, Daniel's 70th week. Chapter 4, verse 1. Cling to it, beloved. We are saved. We are going to be kept from the hour of temptation. Now, everyone raise their hand who thinks that they deserve to be kept from the hour of temptation. <laughs> no, we deserve. The church deserves to go through the hour of temptation. We deserve to go through the tribulation period. The only answer I have for you is grace. That this is the dispensation of grace. We will be caught up. We will be saved. We will not experience what it's like when two-thirds of the earth will die in, in horrific manners, as Mike has been bringing out in his study of Revelation. Okay, uh, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. This is a very, very interesting one for me. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Verse 1, please get it. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. What type of coming? We know that Christ is going to come back to the earth at the end of the tribulation period. The Battle of Armageddon. But is that what he's talking about here in this section? Not according to the rest of this verse. And by our gathering together unto him. So what are we talking about here? The coming of the Lord Jesus, not to the earth, but to the clouds. To the clouds. 
and our gathering together with him, the saints who are dead, and those of us who, and it may happen today, those of us who would be raptured, we would be changed in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye. Our gathering together unto him. But what happens, beloved, when, and Satan knows this precisely, doesn't he? That ye be, look at verse 2, that ye be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled. If you, are, if you do not have the foundation of a pre-tribulation rapture, you are going to... I'm not saying you're not saved. But I'm saying it's going to hurt your witness, your testimony, the peace that you have. Look at this. Neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter as from us, as that the day of Christ, the day of the Lord is at hand. Let no man deceive you. There is a lot of deception going on, on this topic. By any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away, that the man of sin may be revealed, the son of perdition. We're talking about the Antichrist. Who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is God, or that is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. That's going to happen in the middle of the tribulation period. That is the abomination of desolation. That's when the man of sin will be revealed. That's when the man, I'm sorry, the son of perdition will come and say, I am God, worship me. That happens in the middle of the tribulation period. He's going to sit in the temple of God. Verse 5, Remember ye not that when I was with you, I told you these things? And now ye know what withholdeth that he might be revealed in his time. What in the world is the Apostle Paul saying in verse 6? Extremely, extremely important. What, or maybe I, I would ask who? I think probably would be a better pronoun there. Who is withholding the Antichrist from coming into power? It's the Spirit of God. It's the Holy Spirit. Who is the Holy Spirit working through? The American, uh, uh, United States of America? <laughs> the church. We are the ones who are, in, who are indwelt by the Spirit of God. We are the ones who are sealed by the Spirit of God. You, beloved, are withholding the Antichrist. Whoever he's going to be. And Satan doesn't even know who he's going to be. He's had to have somebody in mind for a long time. Because Satan doesn't know when the rapture is going to happen. So he's had to have somebody in place to be the Antichrist since the beginning of the church. Every generation. He's got a man in his pocket. Hmm, is this the Antichrist? Is this the Antichrist? Is this the Antichrist? If Satan doesn't know, stop trying to figure it out. And people love to try to figure it out. We don't know. Because we don't know when it's going to happen. We are the ones who are withholding the church, the bride of Christ, indwelt Spirit of God believers. We're the ones who are withholding the Antichrist. Verse 7, for the mystery of iniquity doth already work, only he, the Spirit of God, who now letteth, and, and I, I kind of wish that they might have used a, a, a little bit more, uh, I don't know, precise word, hindered. Can I, can I replace that? You won't kick me out, will you? Only he who now hindereth will hinder until he be taken out of the way. When is the Holy Spirit going to be taken out of the way? At the rapture of the church. 
Why? Because we're going up. And then, verse 8, please catch the two words. And then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth, and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all powers and si signs and lying wonders, with all deceivableness and unrighteousness in them that perish, because they received not the love of the truth that they might be saved. For this cause God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a, a lie, that they might be damned who believe not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. That's what the tribulation and that's who the tribulation is going to be for. <sighs> okay, one more portion of scripture here. 2 Timothy chapter 4. I may have to save the saying to next week. Well, <laughs> we'll see. I sure is nice not to have that stop clock up here anymore. Boy, that's nice. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 8. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 8. This is one of the crowns. And I, if you get a chance in the bulletin, there's a little uh, excerpt there written by uh, George Zeller on this. Okay. Henceforth there is laid up a crown, uh, for me, a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day. The Apostle Paul was going to receive the crown of righteousness. But he's not the only one. Not to me only, but unto them... And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read this wrong, okay? I'm going to read this wrong. And I'm going to do it purposely now, not on accident like I usually do. But unto the, all them that are looking for his appearing. <laughs> That's not what it says, is it? It's all them that love his appearing. You know, Brother Zeller writes, us, writes in that little excerpt, maybe some of you have already read it. It's cute. He says, uh, one day he got in trouble as a kid. And usually his mom would spank him. But I guess it was such a big issue that he said, you wait till your dad gets home. You know those, those type of days? You wait till your dad gets home. So Brother Zeller says, you know, I, I was looking for my dad to come home, but I sure wasn't loving his appearing when he got home. So let's, let's stress that, right? Not those who are just looking for his appearing, but those who what? What does it say? Love his appearing. That means that we're living and we're anxiously awaiting. We have nothing in our life that we're ashamed of that if he came back today, we wouldn't be going, oh no, please. We're, we're, we're waiting. Is that the way you're living? Is that the way I'm living? I'm going to skip the, um, the saying. I'll get to that next week, okay? Or I'll get to it. I don't know when I'm going to get to it. But I want to think about Enoch. As far as I know, in the history of mankind, there's only two people who haven't died. Elijah, excuse me, Elijah. Let me get the prophet right. Elijah didn't die. He was caught up in a whirlwind. And Enoch. Enoch didn't die. Everyone else in the history of man, as far as I know, and we you do remember that some, even in the Old Testament, were raised from the dead, but they, they died again. Right? We, we know that um, Lazarus died again. Right? But as far as I know, there's only two people who have never died. 
that are not on this earth at this time. Elijah and Enoch. And we want to think about Enoch for just, just a moment, please. Um, turn with me to uh, Genesis chapter 6. I just want you to think about four things about Enoch here. Genesis chapter 6. What did the world look like when Enoch was alive? What did the world look like? And, and I, I, I want to I wanna look at Enoch as a pattern for those who love his appearing. I'm going to say that again. Everybody's turning. I, wanna get, I want you to get your attention. I want to look at Enoch as those, a, a pattern of those that love his appearing. What did the world look like when Enoch was around? Well, Enoch da, or, or is, was not, if you will. He was translated in chapter 5. But we know from chapter 6 that this is what the world looked like at the time. Verse 5, Genesis chapter 6, verse 5. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And it repented the Lord that he had made man on earth, and it grieved him and his heart. That's, that's the atmosphere that Enoch lived in. Why do I bring that out? Because, beloved, you can live the same way that Enoch lived. Look around you. Uh, some people think that the days of Noah were worse than they are today. I don't know. I know it's pretty bad out there. I know it's going to get worse. But what I want to encourage you is that you can love his appearing. You can be like Enoch. Philippians 2, I won't turn there, but Philippians 2, 15, that ye may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God, without rebuke, in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation, among whom ye shine as lights in the world. You shine as lights. Enoch, his light, shined so bright. Okay? Now let's go back to Genesis chapter 5. Enoch had sweet fellowship with God. Number two, Enoch had sweet fellowship with God. Let's read Genesis chapter 5, starting in verse 21. Enoch lived sixty and five years and begat Methuselah. And of course, Methuselah, more than likely one of the oldest, if not the oldest man who ever lived. Enoch walked with God after he begat Methuselah 300 years and begat sons and daughters. And all the days of Enoch were 360 and five years. And then the Bible says, And Enoch walked with God. In the midst of a crooked and perverse generation, Enoch walked with God and was not found. He just disappeared. He just, he just left. Are you looking forward to the rapture of the church? Even so come. Even so come, Lord Jesus. Enoch walked with God and was not for he took him. He just took him. He just translated him. He just... Hebrews 11.5, again I won't turn now, I'll just read it for you. Hebrews 11.5 says, By faith Enoch was translated that he should not see death. Oh death, where is our sting? And was not found, because God had translated him. For before his translation, he had his, this testimony. He pleased God. In a midst of a wicked and a perverse generation, he had a testimony that he pleased God. Enoch 
was of the correct lineage. I think I'm going to skip this one, but you can look at Luke chapter 3 and you find out that Enoch is in the line of Christ. He's in the line of Christ. And if you're saved this morning, beloved, you are in the line of Christ. The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. Joint heirs. Now let's go to the last one. Enoch believed and lived, believed in and lived for the resurrection. Let's go to the book of Jude. Not hard to find. Second to the end, right? Jude. And there's only one chapter. Jude 1. I get a kick out of these people who try to figure out how Enoch knew this. <laughs> I just know he did. Listen to what Enoch was doing. Remember, Genesis says that he walked with God. Hebrews says he pleased God. And now I want you to see a little bit more information about Enoch. Jude and verse 14. And Enoch also, the seventh from Adam, prophesied of these, of these, uh, again, Jude talking about the false prophets, saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousand of his saints. Is that going to happen? Is the Lord coming with ten thousand of his saints? Yes. That's going to come at the end of the tribulation period. And what's the Lord going to do? To execute judgment upon all. And now, I think it's going to be obvious, this word ungodly, 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 right? To execute judgment upon all and to convince all that are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds which they have ungodly committed. And of all their hard speeches which ungodly sinners have spoken against them. These are murmurers, complainers, walking after their own lusts. Their mouth speaketh great swelling words, having men's person in admonition, admir, admir, admonition, boy, I'm trying to hurry too much. Admiration, thank you. Because of advantage. What was Enoch doing for 300 and was it 65? Yeah, 365 years this guy lived on this earth. And what was he doing? He was preaching. He was telling people that there's a judgment coming. A judgment. It, it drives people crazy that Enoch knew this that early. It doesn't drive me crazy at all. Because God is God. I don't know how Enoch got this information. I just know he did. And he wrote it down. Jude wrote it down for us. How did Jude know this? How did Enoch know this? <coughs> the doctrine of inspiration, beloved. The Lord cometh with 10,000 of his saints. What was Enoch living for? He believed in and lived for the resurrection. So let's go back as we close to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. One more verse. Again, I haven't concluded even this message, but um, we'll see how it fits. I know I promised you when the Father begat the Son. Remember, that's next week's message somehow, some way. Come hungry. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. The Apostle Paul ends this wonderful chapter on the doctrine of the resurrection in verse 58, doesn't he? Therefore, because of all these wonderful truths that I've given to you, therefore, my beloved brethren, what's the admonition? Be ye steadfast, unmovable, Always abounding in the work of the Lord. For as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. 
because of the resurrection. Think about what made Enoch such a wonderful example. He was looking forward, looking forward to the coming of Christ. Did he understand the rapture of the church? No. But he knew the Lord was coming back. We know that the Lord is coming back, but we not only know he's coming back, we know when he's coming back, and I mean he's coming back before the tribulation period because the Spirit of God is going to go up, and when the Spirit of God goes up, beloved, we have to too. We're sealed. We're sealed until the day of redemption. Even so come. Even so come, Lord Jesus. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this time. We do pray for our beloved brethren that do not understand these wonderful truths. We pray, Father, that this will be a help and encouragement to them. We ask that you would allow these words to be used by your wonderful spirit. We ask it in Jesus' precious name. Amen.